Good evening, one and all, and welcome. Today, we have a very special story indeed, about one of the most enigmatic books of all time, the Codex Gigas, aka the Devil's Bible. We're joined by the incredibly talented Spooky Stories for You in this twisted tale. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Allow me to take you on a journey with me to Stockholm, Sweden, where the 2017 International Antiquarian Book Fair is currently in progress. Cases of illuminated manuscripts, first editions of classical masterpieces, original drafts and letters in the genius's own hand, and of course, the omnipresent odor of old leather and paper. Yes, there are similar book fairs held all over the world, but this one is singular because of the invaluable artifact I am carrying in my possession, a lost page from the Codex Gigas. The Codex has long held fascination for me since I discovered the legends surrounding its mysterious origin. The Bible was created in a 12th century Benedictine monastery in Bohemia, now part of the Czech Republic. It was written by the monk known as Herman the Recluse, who reportedly broke his monastic vows and was sentenced to be walled alive inside the monastery as punishment. In a desperate attempt to avoid his fate, Herman offered to write a book containing all human knowledge in a single night in exchange for leniency. Herman attempted this impossible task, but his prayers for divine assistance were ignored. As his last resort, the monk offered a prayer to Lucifer, who agreed to finish the book in exchange for his soul. The monk added this picture of the devil in gratitude for his aid. Since its creation, the book has traveled thousands of miles as it has been lost, traded, stolen, and handed down through the generations. The book was damaged when it was plundered in Sweden's 30-year war before reaching its final destination in the National Library of Sweden. Although some of the lost pages have been recovered, many more were destroyed or secretly coveted within private collections around the world. So you can imagine my excitement when I stumbled upon one of the pages being offered in a pawn shop adjacent to a used microwave in a dollhouse. The owner didn't have the faintest idea what it was, but he said he was happy to get rid of it because of the oppressive atmosphere which seemed to surround it. it makes the whole place feel like a graveyard somehow, he told me. Beautiful on the surface, but you can't enjoy it proper on account of what's underneath. The moment I touched the page, I understood what he meant. It was as though the lights in the shop dimmed, although I could still see with perfect clarity. It's difficult to describe, but imagine shutting off all the lights the same instant you develop the ability to see in the dark. I attributed this to a fanciful imagination, born from those old legends, however, and I didn't let it disturb my liquidity at such a valuable discovery. The Latin text was indecipherable to me, but I figured it was just more psalms and could be translated at the ongoing book fair. I brought my prize inside and found a vendor willing to exhibit the page for $125,000 in exchange for a commission. The page wasn't on display for more than five minutes before a small crowd had already begun to form. I'll take it for 100000 an elderly man said. He wasn't so much wearing spectacles as they were wearing him, and I could barely see his face through the mass of lenses. A hundred ten, from a woman wearing so many furs that I shouldn't be surprised if she started howling. Don't sell it yet. Wait for the representative from the National Library, from a third, rushing off through the fair to find him. I readily obliged, my mind already tracing a hundred ways for me to spend my newfound fortune. I expected a fuzzy old librarian to come and try to convince me to donate my find, so I mentally prepared myself to negotiate against the growing number of bids. It took a moment before I recognized the tall man in a suit who returned to be the librarian. His keen blue eyes, long blonde ponytail, and hard, uncompromising jaw didn't fit the stereotypical profile. Two hundred thousand dollars as a final sale were the first words out of his mouth. The bubbling request around us immediately died down into a hushed murmur. The librarian ran his fingers expertly over the vellum pages as though caressing a loved one. 250,000, and you do not consider other bids, the bespeckled man chirped. I couldn't very well ask if anyone could beat it with that stipulation, so I simply raised an eyebrow and waited to see if someone would interject with their own. 
The librarian pulled out his phone and started texting. The phone slid into his pocket, and he put his arm around my shoulder in camaraderie. Or at least that's how he no doubt intended it. This gesture felt more like a car salesman trying to change your mind from a minivan to a sports car. 200 is more than fair, and it would be a national travesty not to have this be reattached to the book it was stolen from. He was trying to subtly steer me away from other bidders, but I held my ground. I'm sorry, but if the other gentleman is the leading bid... What other gentleman? He interrupted. I turned to scan the crowd, but there was no sign of the bespeckled man. Where did he go? He offered 250000 for... Oh, that old trickster, the librarian said, his grip tightening slightly around my shoulders. He's been making false bids all night, just to get a reaction out of people. Come now, he won't find a better deal than 200 grand. I literally paid $80 for the page this morning. I didn't want to get greedy and push my luck, so I agreed. All the proper paperwork was filled out and the exchange was made. The librarian, Dr. Beckel, congratulated me and wrapped his arm around my shoulder once more as we parted. Did you feel it? When you touched the page? Dr. Buckle asked in a half-whisper. I didn't need to ask for clarification. I just nodded, not wanting to sound foolish by indulging in my fantasy. It's nothing compared to the presence of the book. And did you know that it gets stronger with every page that is added? The warm buzz of the book fair faded away around me, and I felt a clammy chill dash across my skin. What is causing it? I asked him. You know, Dr. Buckle grinned. Would you like to touch the book after your page has been restored and reinserted? What on earth for? His smile widened, and he pulled me a little closer against him in his conspiratorial fashion. To greet him with me, of course. The book was breathing. That was the first thing I noticed when I entered the back room of the National Library of Sweden. I hadn't expected Dr. Beckel to call me until this morning, but my restless slumber was disturbed in the dead of night by a phone call. Hello? Hello? Everything okay? I asked. What respectable person would call after midnight except in an emergency? Yes, indeed. Come join me, will you? Who is this? What time is it? I asked. It's Dr. Beckel, and it's imperative you come at once. The line went dead. I squinted against the harsh light from my screen. 1 a.m. A text message flashed the library's address, then another containing a mapped route. I set my phone down, but it kept beeping and flashing. Passcodes to enter the building. Floor directory inside the building. A combination of the backroom vault where the book was. I tried calling him again, but it just went to voicemail. He had evidently planned this out quite extensively. A looming dread hung about me while I stumbled around the room getting dressed. What emergency could possibly arise from a book? Unless, of course, the legends were true. By the time I arrived to the library, I had fully convinced myself against the absurd idea. I didn't see any security on the way in, so I figured Dr. Beckel had dismissed them for the evening and invited me now so I wouldn't be seen. Perhaps it was against their regulations to allow an outsider into the vault, and he was simply extending a courtesy to me for discovering the artifact. Of course, we had enigmatically parted with him saying, to greet him with me, but even that could be an awkward translation for seeing the book. Dr. Beckel was kind enough to speak English for my benefit, so I couldn't hold an odd, turn-off phrase against him. I knew the book was inside even as I approached the door. The air was somehow tangible as though resisting my advance, and a compulsion set about me to run without cause. I typed the vault combination into the keypad and opened the door, and I was shocked to find my fingers stiff as though frostbitten by cold. Dr. Beckel was standing over a steel table with a massive tomb open before him. I didn't get a true sense of the thing scale from a page, but weighing in at at least 165 pounds, measuring almost 3 by 2 feet across, and stitched with the skin from over 150 different donkeys, the Codex Gigas was truly the most magnificent book I had ever encountered. Oh, and it was… breathing. The pages fluttered softly up and down in the dead air and I could feel my own breath and heart automatically resonate and match the even pulses. The sensation of a nameless terror was even stronger up close, 
almost as though I just remembered it was being chased while not being able to recall who or what was pursuing me. It's beautiful, isn't it? Dr. Beckle asked, not taking his eyes off the book. His words came in short, halting bursts as they too matched the pulsing rhythm. It thanks you for the missing page. What is going on? I tried to force myself to take a deep breath, but it caught my throat and expelled involuntarily in time with the rhythm. Dr. Beckel closed the codex and the intensity of its presence immediately lessened. He turned toward me with a maniacal gleam in his eye, almost as terrifying as the book. Do you know what is so fascinating about Herman the Recluse? His words slurred over one another in their haste, and I didn't have the chance to respond. Not the desperate plight he found himself in. Not that he wrote this. Not even that his soul is still bound within its pages. What is truly remarkable about Herman is that when he called out in the blackest night of his need, he found a voice who answered. But how do you know about his soul? What has it... What has he told you? He told me he wants out, that he's ready to make a deal again, Dr. Beckel said, tenderly running his hands down the book's spine. Only he has nothing left to offer the devil, so he's made a deal with me instead. I don't understand what any of this has to do with me, I replied. If he was just trying to show off, then I'd seen enough. But it has everything to do with you. Dr. Beckel practically shrieked. I need Herman to tell me he struck a deal with Lucifer, and Herman needs a body to bind his soul and escape the book. Naturally, I couldn't offer my own. But you, my dear, dear fellow, have a perfect vessel for his use. Beckel opened the book again now, and my heart arched as it strained to race in conflict with the encompassing rhythm. The words burned upon the page as though written in fire, and though I urged my body to retreat toward the door, I found my feet jolting inexorably forward with each gasping breath. I struggled hopelessly as Dr. Beckel whipped a butterfly knife from his pocket. I tried to lurch out of his reach, but only fell sprawling on my back as my feet continued relentlessly plodding toward the book. I needn't have worried, though, because Dr. Beckel hadn't intended to use the knife on me. I watched from the ground as he drew a blade across his own palm, spilling his blood freely over my reclaimed page. The thick drops sizzled on the paper like water does in a hot pan, and a cloud of bloody must pervaded the air. The deal is struck, <laughs> Dr. Beckel grunted through the pain. Take your prize, and then deliver mine. The odor from the red mist stung my eyes and blurred my mind. The sound of his voice was like an avalanche. The intolerable pulse from the heaving book dominated my thoughts until my entire world existed in each beat. Each pause between was a vacuous nightmare of suspense and anticipation. I didn't exactly see what happened after that, but I could sense it as though imagining a scene from a book. I felt my body. What used to be my body, anyway. Standing up from the floor to stagger across the room, I felt Dr. Beckel embrace him and help him stand. Take your time, Herman, Dr. Beckel said. It's been 900 years since you last walked. You might have forgotten a thing or two. Is that long? I heard my own voice reply. That is no greater span than an hour in hell, just as infinite suffering cannot be halved. Eternity, then, has come and gone, and my pact with Lucifer has at last resolved. Dr. Beckel opened the door. I tried to shout, to move, but I had no body to fight against my prison. Eternity is nothing to me if it means I can wield the devil's hand. You will show me the right you called him by. If I have learned anything from my ordeal, Herman said from my body, is the power of one's word. I shall give on to you what is promised, but we must first gather some ingredients for the ritual. I had never felt such an abject anguish as watching my body leave me. I couldn't feel pain as I did when I was alive. No receptors or frayed nerves registered my dire situation, but I was overcome with a spiritual torment which crushed my every perception. In that moment, every good memory of my life was tainted, every smile twisted. Every affection insincere, and every triumph or pride I ever possessed was altered to feature my shame and self-loathing. 
I felt as though I must have lived the most despicable life in the history of man, but even knowing it was over brought me no relief because I knew I must spend eternity now recalling and obsessing over my misery. I felt I must be destined to wait until unknown eons brought the human race crumbling into death around me, and still I would be bound to sit alone and dwell upon my grief. I don't know how much time passed in such a miserable state, but I blessed the disruption of the opening door as though it were an angel coming to rescue me. The bespeckled man from the book fair, now carrying a large backpack, crept into the room to regard me. He walks effortlessly up to the steel table as though unaffected by the book's preternational presence to close my door. Instantly I felt some degree of sanity and stability return, and I held on to my conscious spark for all he was worth. Can you hear me? I screamed in my mind. Herman has stolen my body. I'm trapped here. Henry. Henry Higgins. He replied. Presumably his name, Henry withdrew an identical codex gigas from his backpack and laid it upon the table. He then picked me up and secured me in the pack. What? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Now where did they go? To gather ingredients for a rite to summon Lucifer, but I don't know what. Not to worry, I'll handle it from here. Come now, we're going to get your body back. Why are you helping me? Because Dr. Beckel stole something from me. His narrowed eyes flashed dangerously behind his spectacles. And that was a very foolish thing to do. Henry Iggins moved with the vitality of a much younger man. I could sense my surroundings around the backpack and felt him carry me to one obscure shop after another. I couldn't quite make out where these places were, but none of them had any signs or banners to distinguish their unusual wares. The hand of a nun, skeletal fragments from dead kings, and a cat which had been skinned and turned inside out, just to name a few. Henry conversed rapidly with each shop owner in an unfamiliar tongue before moving on to the next. After three or four such shops, he seemed to receive an answer which satisfied him, prompting us to take a cab out of town. What are you going to do when you find him? That depends on how quick we are. If he has already finished the ritual, then it will be up to him to decide what will happen next. Do you have any idea why he wants to make a pact with Lucifer? Not precisely, but I am familiar with his type. No doubt some short-sighted, selfish goal that will not bring him half the satisfaction he is anticipating. But you weren't going to use the book for the same thing, were you? Do I look like a fool? Perhaps I do. But that is a fault of my years and not my sensibilities. No, I simply want to make him pay. No one steals from me. My ordinary senses might be clouded, but I could feel the ritual in progress like a black lighthouse drawing me through the woods. Henry trusted my directions as I navigated through the dense pine trees which huddled so close together as to block out the sky. As I drew near, I could feel the rhythm of my own pulse harmonize with the presence. My conscious thoughts were devoured by the beat, and I must have lost consciousness for a moment, because suddenly I was in a clearing of trees inside a large circle of salt upon the ground. Who are you? What are you doing here? Dr. Beckel asked. He was standing with Herman, who knelt with a bloody butcher's knife. Rolls of yellowed parchment lay as bedding for a headless goat which stained the paper deep scarlet. I hope I didn't interrupt anything, Henry Egan said. That man from the book fair. Dr. Beckel choked in disbelief. And what have you caught there? It does not matter, Herman said. The ritual is complete. Lucifer arrives. I strained to feel if anything had changed. The presence which drew me here had lifted. The pulsing was all but gone. Dr. Beckel glanced anxiously around him while Herman remained kneeling with his head bowed in silent reverence. You tricked me, Dr. Beckel snarled. Where is he? Why don't I see him? He's already here, Herman replied. Henry again shrugged and put down the backpack. Satan sum et nihil humanum et me alienum puto. Game is up, boys. But you didn't need all that mumbo jumbo to bring me here. If you want my attention, all you have to do is steal from me. He didn't feel any different, but there was something about the tone of Henry's voice which left no doubt in my mind. The words carried a certain weight as though gravity itself would stop to listen to what he said. 
I had spent the afternoon with the devil without even realizing it. Herman and I had a deal, Henry continued, and I know the same presence must be weighing on the others, for they let him speak without interruption. His soul was mine from the moment I bound it with the Codex Gigas, and by setting him free you have stolen from me. I do not like being stolen from. The last words bellowed from all directions like the forest itself was screaming. Dr. Beckel fell to his knees from the impact of that voice, but he immediately reclaimed his footing. Take him back. I don't care, Beckel said. You and I have a deal, though, don't we? I called you when you answered. You shall serve me if you want my soul, too. First things first, Henry said. He snapped his fingers and I coughed blood. Both events happened simultaneously. One instant I was inside the book, the next I was kneeling in the circle beside Dr. Beckel, back in my own body. Enough! Dr. Beckel screamed. Now for my wish, Lucifer. I want you to let all the sinners out of hell and bring them here to earth. I want your army of the damned to obey my orders and serve me until my dying breath. Until the day you return to claim my soul, I don't want to see you again. Henry laughed, long peals of sardonic laughter which reverberated down into my bones. A cold wind whistled through the trees, making the whole forest seem to be laughing alongside him. Dr. Beckel gripped the knife tighter in his hand, looking as though he were about to lunge at Henry. The rite is complete. We have a duel, Lucifer. Don't worry. The damned will be here soon enough, Henry said. They will rise with the coming of the beast. But Herman never made a deal with Lucifer. There is no Lucifer. When he called out into the night, it was I who answered, and I do not serve man. What are you? Dr. Beckel dropped once more to his knees. How are you even in this world if it were not for my summons? The second demon seed has grown ripe within me, Henry said. And so I have returned. Five more to go before the beast arrives. Dr. Beckel growled in exasperation and leaped at Henry. The bespeckled man waved his hand and a searing flame engulfed the librarian. I watched, transfixed as Beckel's skin melted off like running water, revealing bones splitting from the heat and clouds of evaporating blood and marrow which filled the air. Henry turned his gaze toward me, where I still knelt in the circle. He grinned, sheepishly, like a schoolboy who was caught misbehaving. Thank you for your help. I have already replaced the codex with a fake, so you may keep the real one for your trouble. You aren't gonna hurt me? I asked. I had so many more questions, but that was all I could force out of my dry mouth. Of course not. I still need you, he said. I need you to spread the fear of what has faded until mankind screams with one voice, so that together we may welcome his arise. I still have the Codex Gigas, although I can't imagine how I will smuggle it out of the country when I return to the States next week. After knowing what it is like, I feel terrible for Herman now trapped inside once more. I considered burning the cursed tomb, but somehow, the weight of its presence and its connection with that demon makes me believe it still has a role to play. Perhaps I will simply hide it until the time of the beast has begun. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I would like to start off by giving Spooky Stories for You a huge shout out and thank you for her incredible narration today. Please be sure to check out her channel, with the link provided in the description as well as on screen now. And a special birthday shout out to Miss Wiz and Nolmi300. I hope you both had a wonderful day. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.